Okay, so now we're getting on to a bit, bit more related to the material. So the goals of this course are to bring everybody, so you've all come from different school backgrounds where the, your teachers have emphasized different bits of physics. Some of you have actually come from outside the country, so you'll have gone through different, uh, uh, different syllabus. Uh, so the purpose of an introductory course is always to get everybody up to the same level. So this will mean that at the start of the course, a lot of the material that we're going to be going through, most of you will probably have seen, and as we go through the course, uh, it should get more interesting as the, uh, as the material gets newer. So at the point where most people are finding that there's new stuff in this course is when we get to, to rigid body rotations, so we do rotational dynamics uh, for rigid bodies, and that's new, I think, to generally new to most most of you, and then right at the end, we get the little sort of jewel of this course, we spend the last couple of weeks doing uh, uh, special relativity, not general relativity, because the maths for that will blow your mind. But special relativity is great, because it's something new, the maths isn't that hard, but it's a completely new concept, uh, 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 and it's fun. So that, that's what we're going to be covering in terms of the content. Um, the main goals, though, of going through the material that you've already covered is to improve and expand your problem-solving skills, right? So this is, if you're not going to carry on and do physics, you're going to go do something else. This is the one thing that you should be uh, uh, taking from this course, is the way to look at a problem and analyze a problem, turn it, figure out which bits of physics you're going to use, turn that into equations, and then use them to solve the problem. So the ability to take a, a, a written problem and, and turn it into, into the math that you need to solve it is, uh, is a very useful skill, even if you're in your chemistry, computer science, whatever, it doesn't matter. That's a, a, a useful skill for you to have. Oops. Okay. So, uh, well, I mentioned the teaching methods last time, so I'll skip over that. And I, I mentioned the, uh, uh, the labs and the, uh, and the worked examples last time. So for problem-solving techniques, so the assignments, so these are, uh, all the assignments are going to involve having to do problems. So the general strategies, so these are just a list of general strategies that it's, that it's useful to, to use when approaching problems, right? They're not particular to a particular class of problem. So the first thing that always helps is draw a diagram. Sometimes the problems will have diagrams in them to help explain what they're asking. Sometimes they will not. It's always a good idea for you to draw the diagram, and then you can annotate it with forces, accelerations, whatever you want to add. So always draw a problem because it will help your understanding. But take a little bit of time and make sure you draw it properly, because if you draw the, uh, the wrong diagram, you're going to probably end up getting the question wrong. Uh, so you know, take a little bit of time and, and, and make sure that you get it right. But it's a very good way to take all the information that's written in the question and put it in a pictorial form, which helps you digest it uh, and gives you a clue as to what bit of physics you're going to need to, to solve the problem. And so part of that is writing down what you know from the question. So taking the information out of the question where it's written in, in prose uh, and putting it down in sort of equations or something a little bit closer to the math that you're going to be using uh, uh, to solve it. The other technique is to solve things symbolically. Now, I know a lot of you, when you've been going through school, you're used to these questions where you know, you're given things like you know, the acceleration is 2.7 meters per second squared, the velocity is 3 meters per second, and so on. And you're given numbers for all of these things. And a lot of you have then a tendency to take all these numbers, cram them into equations, and, and go through uh, and numerically. You're a lot better off if you at least try uh, and do as many questions as you can using algebra rather than using numbers. Now, it takes a bit of getting used to because, of course, uh, uh, you know, algebra, uh, algebra, al the algebraic manipulation is a different set of skills from sticking numbers in a calculator and pressing equals. But this is a very useful skill uh, uh, to learn. For a start, it's often a lot quicker. Um, actually, I'm going to switch these over because I can see that one better. Uh, there we go. So it's a lot quicker when you're doing multiplication. It's very easy to, uh, in algebra, it's very easy to write GL. Uh, you don't have to stick numbers into a calculator and press equals. Uh, you're also less likely to make mistakes, right? It's very easy to write G times L. Uh, if you're sticking numbers into a calculator, all you have to do is, is get one of the digits wrong somewhere or press the wrong operator key or whatever, uh, and you can end up uh, with a mistake or you can misread what you've written, and you can write 219 instead of 279 and so on. The other advantage you have is you end up with one solution. 
If you go through it symbolically, and you end up with an answer that's an algebraic expression, um, the you know, multi-part questions may sort of say, first of all, you know, what's the acceleration of this object under these conditions? And if you uh, calculate an expression and then stick the numbers in at the end for the first part, the next part typically asks, you know, what happens if the gravitational field goes to zero? Or what happens if this was performed on the moon with the sixth of the gravitational field? Things like that. And you can immediately go back to your algebraic formula, and you, it'll be immediately very obvious, you know, you see g, well, if g goes to a sixth of what it was before the acceleration, you know, increases by a factor of six, decreases by a factor of six, or six squared, or whatever, right? You can figure this out very quickly from an algebraic expression, numerically, not so easy. Uh, it also helps you understand relationships in case there are special cases asked, you know, what happens if the gravitational field goes to zero? Even if there aren't special relationships asked, it's a very good way for you to check uh, uh, whether your answer makes sense, right? So, for example, if you're calculating the maximum height that something's thrown in the air, you're, you're calculating the maximum height of trajectory of the ball, and you come up with some answer that's an algebraic expression, you can ask yourself, well, what happens if gravity increases? Right? Well, if you look at your expression and you say, well, if I, if I double the strength of gravity, the ball goes a lot higher, then you know that something's wrong because intuitively, the stronger the gravitational field, the less high the ball is going to go. So, you know, if you've, if you've got g in the wrong uh, uh, side of your fraction, you can test and, and, and sort of test sensible cases. So, it's a lot easier or a lot, lot better, maybe not easier to actually do it the first few times you try, but overall, you'll be a lot better off if you do things symbolically. And certainly by the time you get into second year courses, if you do physics uh, in the second year and you're dealing with quantum mechanics, um, those things have uh, things called complex numbers, which you cannot numerically evaluate, right? You have to use uh, algebraic expressions. So it's also good practice for higher level courses. Um, other things to do is, so once you've got your answer, um, first thing to do is to check uh, your units and, uh, uh, and dimensions. So if you're calculating a length and you come up with units of kilograms, not good, right? You know, you, you, you've got to have the right unit so you can check this. And we'll talk a little bit about dimensional analysis uh, 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 in a few slides. Um, you can also check the order of magnitude uh, uh, of your numerical answers. So I, I once had a question on an exam where I was asking uh, 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 you, know, you to calculate the mass of a planet, and uh, you know, one person put you know, 7.3 kilograms. Well, you know, alarm bells should have been ringing in your head. Planets do not weigh 7.3 kilograms, um, and the mass of a planet, not 7.3 kilograms. So you know, obviously, you can't pot, spot all errors uh, this way. You know, if you've got 7 times 10 to the 23 instead of 7 times 10 to the 24, you aren't going to spot that uh, uh, in kilograms for a planet. Um, but, you know, if, if, uh, you, know, if you get 0.5 kilograms, uh, you, clearly there is a problem. Okay, so now we're going to go on some of the basic math. So this is stuff that I'm hoping you are all familiar with, or, or at least you all need to get familiar with. So uh, uh, sine, cosine, tangent... Uh, basic right angle triangle, and you have the mnemonics to remember which is which, sine, sine, opposite over hypotenuse, cosine, adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent, uh, um, uh, no, what's that one? Uh, toa? Oh, tangent is opposite over hypotenuse. I was getting confused by what the T was, yeah. Um, so these should all be very, very familiar, right? We're going to be using this a lot, particularly when we get to vectors in resolving components. Uh, this is essential. You know, if this hypotenuse is your vector, then you can have the x and y components are going to be the sides of this triangle, and you're going to be able to calculate the sides of those triangles given the magnitude of the vector and an angle theta, right? So that's uh, uh, going to be one of the essential things that we do a lot in, in this course. So vectors, uh, again, you should all be familiar with vectors. There's a variety of notations uh, uh, that are used. Um, now, I think more commonly people are, are happy with two-dimensional vectors. Uh, you also need to be happy with three-dimensional vectors since we live in a world with three dimensions, not two. Um, admittedly, most questions will only use two dimensions. But particularly, in fact, when we get onto relativity, uh, even three isn't going to be enough, and we're going to be using four-dimensional vectors. Uh, so that'll be fun. Um, 
So you can write it here in column notation, in uh, a component, your know, horizontal notation. So that's an example here of what we call a four vector from relativity. Um, or you can write it as a sum of unit vectors where i, j, and k uh, are the unit vectors. Algebraically, uh, uh, you see it written in three different ways here. Sometimes you see it written with an underline, sometimes just in boldface, and sometimes with a little arrow over the top. I am going to always try and use this notation wherever possible. Uh, there's a few times where the math layout will not let me do that, and I have to fall back to, uh, to one of these notations. But I will always try and use that because it's very explicit then that I'm talking about a vector. So one of the questions that sometimes gets asked is, are these things here, are these components, are these uh, a component of a vector? Is it a vector or a scalar? Uh, well, it depends on how you write it. If you write it like this, then x here is a, is a scalar quantity. It's not a vector. It doesn't have a direction. It's just a number because the direction is encoded here. If I write that as a single uh, you know, x hat vector, then that's a component vector because it's a, got the direction in, encoded in it. So, but I will tend to write things this way. I will not write them as, as component vectors. I'll write them as uh, 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 scalar components. So, oh, sorry, I'm to, sorry, talking about it here. So here, here's how it works. So these are the component vectors. You've got AX, AY, uh, and AZ. So these are component vectors. And these are, and this is when you split it up here. So this is a component, but it's a scalar rather than a vector, right? So always keep the little arrows uh, over the top or whatever notation you prefer, uh, because you know, otherwise you'll lose track of whether you're talking about vectors or scalars. So resolving vectors is something that this is, this is uh, uh, one of the sort of the key core skills which I'm, I, I'm expecting you to sort of uh, already start with having done it uh, uh, at school. Um, so when we're taking, we can take this single vector here, I can, we, we can resolve it into two orthogonal components, the two components at right angles. So the way we do this is if you look, this is a right angle triangle here. And so this is the hypotenuse. So we've got a hypotenuse of length r, and we've got sides of r1 and r2. So if we, uh, I'm new to these document cameras. Um, so here's our right angle triangle here. So here is our vector r. This is r1 and this is R2. So if we look at this, the cosine of theta is the adjacent, so that's R1, divided by the hypotenuse, which is R. So if we want to calculate the magnitude of R1, there we go. OK. So we've got our right angle triangle here. Cosine of this angle is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, that's R1 over R. So R1 is just R cosine theta. And similarly, if we do it for R2, but now we use the sine, the sine of theta is equal to the opposite, so that's R2 divided by the hypotenuse, which is R. And so that gives us that R2 is equal to R sine theta. So what this means is, if we want to resolve a uh, vector into two uh, perpendicular components, then if we've got our angle theta here, if we're closing the angle, so we want to know the component that, is, that we get when we close the angle, then we use cosine. So closing equals cosine. And if you want the uh, component you get when you open the angle, then opening the angle you get sine, right? And we're going to use that uh, 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 a lot um, when we're uh, doing things in this course. So a whole load of vectors that we're always resolving uh, um, into perpendicular components. Um, OK, so this is just more on a little bit on vector notation. Uh, you can have the magnitude of the vector. And the magnitude of a two-dimensional vector is the sum 
of the squares of the, the magnitudes of the orthogonal components. That's just straight Pythagoras. There's nothing special there. And then you can also have what's called the argument of a vector that's just essentially the uh, uh, inverse tangent of the ratio of the magnitudes of the components. So basically, that's sort of your, your angle theta, uh, the angle between the vector and the positive x-axis. Um, you can also use compass bearings. Uh, these will occur early on in the course in maybe one or two questions where 0, 0, 0 is due north, 180 is due south, and you go round the compass points clockwise. Okay, so what's new, I think, for, for a few of you is doing the magnitude of a three-dimensional vector. Um, it's not hard to, to, to come up and calculate it. So if you've got a three-dimensional vector here, so going from the origin up to a point B here, which has got X, Y, and Z, then we can consider a, a vector A where the Z is like B, essentially, but the Z component is just set to zero. So this vector A lives in the X, Y plane. And the length of this vector, the magnitude of this vector, we already know how to calculate. It's a two-dimensional vector. The magnitude of this vector along here by Pythagoras is just the square root of x squared plus y squared. So if we now look at this gray triangle here on the diagram, then we can see that the length of this side is the square root of x squared plus y squared, and the length of this side, which is vertical, is just going from z equals 0 up to z. So the length of this side is just z. So the length OB, looking at this gray triangle, is just OA squared plus Z squared. Well, OA squared is X squared plus Y squared. So the magnitude of the vector uh, uh, of a three-dimensional vector is essentially the square root of the sum of the squares of its components. So that's how we extend magnitudes to three dimensions. Instead of square root of X squared plus Y squared, it's just square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and that comes straight out of uh, uh, Pythagoras, right? So that's the magnitude for a three-dimensional uh, vector. Okay, so the other thing we can do with vectors is you can multiply them. So uh, a scalar product of two vectors, or dot product, I'm hoping, has every, who, who has not seen the dot product between two vectors? Okay, so there's, about, there's, a, there's a couple of you that haven't seen this. So um, the dot product between two vectors is a, ends up with a scalar, so it's just a simple numerical value. And the numerical value is equal to the magnitude of the two vectors multiplied together times the cosine of the angle between them. So this is covered a little bit in the book. So if you haven't seen it, uh, uh, read through the book. Uh, the other thing you should be, uh, you can look at is, I think, your, your uh, 100 level maths text uh, will, I hope, cover this as well, perhaps in a little bit more detail than the physics text. But it is actually in the physics book uh, uh, that you've got. So uh, look that up in, in here if you're, if you're unfamiliar with it. You don't have to worry about writing it down like a, a matrix notation like this. Um, this sort of shows you a little bit. The reason I do this is because when we get into uh, relativity, uh, this thing here changes a little bit. Um, but essentially, the way you calculate the dot product between two vectors is you multiply each of the uh, components together. So, oh, sorry, yeah. So uh, AX times BX plus AY times BY plus AZ times BZ. So these are the scalar components or the scalar magnitudes of the uh, 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 three base vectors in X, Y, and Z. So that's how you calculate a, a dot product. And this will become useful when we start talking about work uh, and energy uh, because we use dot products between a force vector and a, a displacement vector to calculate the amount of work that's been done. So dot product here, this is just a mathematical definition. So if you haven't seen it before, all you need to remember is that this is what it's equal to and that's how you calculate it if you've got the components. So the one that you might not have seen before is the vector product. How many people have seen the vector product before? Okay, so now there's about as many people have seen the vector product as haven't seen the dot product. Um, so the vector product, again, have a look in the, uh, in the textbook. It's explained in a little bit more detail there, uh, and you'll probably be going through it in one of your maths courses uh, uh, this term. 
Um, we don't do this until after the midterm. So this is just sort of a, a, a warning shot across the bows uh, that this is something you, you'll need to get a little bit familiar with. We don't do a lot of this in this course, but we do mention it a, a little bit in passing uh, when we get on to uh, rotational kinematics, so the, the rotation of rigid bodies. But that's after the midterm. Um, so we have, there's also a way you can, uh, you can take a cross product between two vectors, and that gives you another vector and this only works in three dimensions. You cannot do it in two dimensions because the vector you get um, taking the cross product of two vectors A and B is perpendicular to both A and B. And obviously, if you're in two dimensions, you can't have a third vector that's perpendicular to two others because there just isn't enough uh, uh, as many dimensions as you need to do that. So if you look at this, then you have a vector A, a vector B, and A cross B ends up being perpendicular uh, to these two, and the magnitude of this vector is given by the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times sine theta. And you calculate it in component form uh, using a determinant uh, like this, where you write the component vectors on the top, the uh, components of A, next line, components of B in the third line, and then you evaluate it like this. So if you're wanting to know the I component, you block out the column and the row associated with I, and then you do the red, component, the red multiplication minus the blue multiplication. Um, for the J component, you do it similarly, only you swap the ordering. So you do this, this diagonal first, then that diagonal, and then finally, uh, for the K component, you block out the last two rows and do the same thing. So you don't ha I mean, this is just the method to calculate it. I'm not going to go into the whys of why this is the formula that's used. That, that's what excites mathematicians. Um, we're, we're, we're using the, the technology, so uh, uh, that'll be explained in your maths course uh, if you're doing any linear algebra. Uh, but all you need to know for this course is that this is the formula to calculate it. You need to know what the magnitude is and what the direction is, and that's all you need to know. Right? And this is just the method by which you can calculate a vector that's perpendicular to both A and B. Right? So any questions on vectors? Yeah. Okay, so this is just a property of, if you, if you swap the order of the multiplication, so if you put all the Bs along here and all the As along there, right, then what will happen is all of these pro products will swap around and the result is you'll get a negative sign. So this is a, this may be the first time you've encountered it. So there's, um, certain uh, uh, rules when you've got any operation like multiplication, division, uh, you know, subtraction, so on, uh, there are certain properties that these things have. One is that there, uh, one is associativity, uh, and all the operators you encounter will be a, a associative. In other words, if you do, if you've got A, B, well, okay, I'll explain what was. So, oops. So, associ uh, associative, means that if you've got some operation and you do this, so you do um, A and then some operation B and C, uh, this is the same as if you did A, right? So that's associative, so that's one type of property. The one that's relative here uh, um, is commutative. This is more maths than physics, though. Um, so something is commutative if A operating on B is equal to B operating on A, right? And in this case, in, uh, uh, it is not commutative. You cannot do A operating on B. It's not going to be equal to B operating on A. But this is exactly the same as you. You've already seen this with division, right? If you do... Uh, 10 divided by 2, it's different than 2 divided by 10, right? So it's the same sort of thing that's going on here with a, with a vector cross product, right? It just flips the signs. Okay. So a little bit on calculus because we're going to need to use calculus uh, um, in this course. We're a calculus-based course. So basic familiarity 
with simple calculus is, is something that we assume. Um, there's an online lesson which I mentioned last time you can go through if you want to, if you haven't done Math 31 or you're a little bit concerned about your calculus skills. Really, the only thing that we're going to need here for differentiation is that if you've got some function f here and it's x to the n plus c, if you differentiate that with respect to x, uh, you get n times x to the n minus 1. Right? If you don't know differentiation, you, haven't, you won't be doing it until about the midterm time in the, in the 113, I think it is, maths course, then just use this formula as a black box uh, uh, until we get, um, uh, uh, until you've actually covered it in the maths course. Right? This is really all you'll, you'll need to know um, for, for the moment in this course. Um, similarly, integration. Um, if we integrate x to the n, then we get this formula here plus a constant c. Um, and you can also integrate something with limits, which means you're integrating it from x equals a up to x equals b. Right? So you can integrate over a region. And again, these are the formulae that you get. Uh, the online maths lesson uh, goes through it in a little bit more detail, explains where this formula comes from. Um, well, a little bit of where this formula comes from. The, the actual math behind this is a little bit complicated. So uh, for integration, I don't go into too much detail. Um, but uh, you can go through the online maths lesson and see where these formulae come from and what the interpretation means. It's the area between the points A and B here, the, the x equals A and x equals B. So if I draw this here, so if you've got a, and some function here, f of x, and this is x, then the integral between a and b of f of x dx is equal to this shaded line, the shaded area here between the line and the positive x-axis. So that's the interpretation of um, uh, the interpretation of an integral, graphical interpretation. So again, you just need to be familiar uh, with that, and you can use the online lesson to, to refresh or come and talk to me in office hours, or uh, when we get the TA sorted out next, uh, next week, uh, talk to the TA. Um, okay, so that's the uh, end of the, uh, uh, the, sort of the intro slides. So to just summary, we've discussed the, the goals and the methods of the course, uh, the labs and the examples, the various problem solving techniques, and then the basics of vectors and the basics of calculus that we're going to need. So any questions on that before we really get stuck into the physics? Okay, good. You'll have to wave your hand a little bit about because there's so many of you spread out that it's, it's, if one of you just raises your hand, I might not catch it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, uh, units and measurements. So this is the basis of all physics, right? You can't get anywhere without uh, uh, units and, and measurements. So first thing we're doing, we're an introductory course, so it's nice to be able to explain what on earth is physics. Well, if you ask any uh, physicist, uh, you'll get a variety of answers. It's the you know, beautiful phenomena in nature. It's uh, understanding the, the Big Bang. Uh, and the formation of the universe. It's looking out at the stars and, and galaxies and understanding processes that are going on there light years away from us. Uh, so, uh, you know, understanding stellar evolution, black holes. Um, uh, you've got geophysicists that study the Earth's interior. So this is a uh, model of the Earth's magnetic field. Um, uh, and my personal favorite is, of course, uh, particle physics. So building massive underground detectors and, and uh, studying the, the smallest uh, scale physics known to uh, humans. Um, of course, if you ask somebody who's not a physicist, then they usually sort of uh, you know, roll their eyes and, and, and have a picture of physics that's, that's all this complicated, nasty-looking maths. Um, as, as one t-shirt once sort of said, uh, it is actually rocket science. Uh, that, that includes physics. Um, if you're a chemist, it's potentially even uh, worse. This was in the uh, Edmonton Journal um, 
a few years ago. It's, it's uh, you know, chemists, some chemists view this as the, uh, the end of the world. Uh, you know, to quote this uh, chemist Otto Rossler from, uh, uh, from Germany, my own calculations have shown that it is quite plausible that these black holes from the Large Hadron Collider will survive and grow exponentially and eat the planet from the inside. Um, so if you talk, be careful who you talk to when you're asking about chemistry. Uh, the, the usual adage is that uh, you know, if, it, if it moves, it's biology, if it smells, it's chemistry, and if it doesn't work, it's physics. Um, this is obviously the adage he's using because this doesn't work. Uh, so it doesn't always work that way. So why do we have this dichotomy between you know, the end of the world on one side and all these beautiful uh, uh, physical phenomena on the other? Well, this is what physics describes. The problem is, is that this is, what phys this is how we describe it. Right? We use maths to describe it. Uh, and if you get this wrong, then you can turn pictures like this into the uh, black hole at the end of the world. Um, so we use the language of mathematics to describe the natural world uh, around us. And this is why a lot of people think physics is really hard. It's not the description, you know, the, the phenomena that we study. They're not the, the hard things. It's the fact or all these complicated maths that we use to describe them gets in the way sometimes of actually understanding what's going on. However, we have to use maths because that's the only way that we can write down in a very precise form exactly what is going on. So we, we have to use this, and this unfortunately sometimes gets in the way of seeing the, the, the beautiful phenomena that we're, we're studying. So the, the analogy uh, that's commonly used is it's like learning to play a musical instrument. You have to spend years practicing your scales and scaring the family cat um, so that you can get the skills to the point where you can actually play beautiful music. And it's the same with physics. Uh, you have to sit through a, a, a lot of boring maths, uh, sorry, interesting maths, um, but difficult maths. Uh, you, you have to learn a lot of maths, which may not be you know, what most excites you, in order to be able to explain all the phenomena that you see uh, uh, in the world. So uh, uh, XKCD, uh, uh, which is an online comic, had a, 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 a beautiful little comic of how the sciences fit together uh, and where physicists sit. Uh, so they have the, sort of the various, you know, so chemistry is applied physics, which is applied biology, which is applied you know, psychology, and so, oh, sorry, the other way around. Um, and of course, the mathematicians sit off here, uh, uh, right at the bottom, uh, beneath all of us, being far more fundamental. Um, before the mathematicians get too smug, though, the reason there's a big gap here is because that's where the line between the real world sits. <laughs> <laughs> And, and if you're a string theorist, you're sort of sitting on this line, not quite sure which side of it you're on. So, so what is physics? So it's the, it's the study of the fundamental properties of the universe right? that we, that we live in. So we're, we're really trying to understand the fundamentals uh, of space-time, you know, so the structure of space-time. We'll talk about this when we do relativity. And the properties of matter and energy and how, or the matter, you know, it, it's, it's what its constituents of matter are and how those constituents interact with each other, right? All of this is physics. So the next question is, is why on earth do we do all of this? Well, it's the foundation of a lot of technological advances, right? If we go back to the XKCD cartoon, of course, we're sitting below chemistry, biology, uh, and all the rest. And so discoveries in physics can have applications both in physics and to our everyday lives, but also can have knock-on effects for the other sciences uh, as, they, as they take uh, uh, new discoveries in physics, can be, uh, uh, have applications in biology and, and chemistry and so on. Of course, we also get ideas. It's not just a one-way street. Sometimes the chemists will come up with, uh, with very clever ideas of solving things, and we can apply these to sort of uh, uh, how we do physics. But then in that case, what it usually is is, is the techniques that sort of flow back, and we think, gosh, we can use a technique that a chemist or a biologist developed, uh, and maybe that'll give us a bit of insight in, into the fundamental physics. So it's a, it's a two-way street. We all work happily together. Um, but some of the things that have come up, uh, uh, come from uh, physics, is semiconductors. So anytime you turn on your mobile phone, computer, whatever, uh, you're using semiconductors. 
And to build a semiconductor, you've got to understand quantum physics. And that was sort of the fundamental physics uh, in the early 1900s. So just under 100 years ago, the fundamental physics that people at the time were scratching their heads and saying, why is anybody interested in doing these tiny uh, atomic physics experiments? Um, you know, 80 years down the line uh, is, is prevalent in every, uh, every aspect of everyday life. Um, X-rays, ultrasound, magnetic resonance imaging, all of these are uh, techniques that doctors use to diagnose uh, uh, problems. All of these rely on physics. Um, and of course, you've got modern telecommunications require an understanding of electromagnetic radiation from James Clark Maxwell, uh, uh, rocketry and satellites that give us our uh, 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 you know, expand those communication capabilities. Uh, you've got to understand basic mechanics and Newtonian gravity. And in fact, we'll be covering the basic uh, rocket science in this course. Um, but of course, simple curiosity is also a driving factor, right? We don't, not, not many academics will sit down and say, today I'm going to invent the flying car. Um, they're, they're more interested, uh, we're more interested in, in uh, you know, probing things like, uh, you know, how was the universe created? What was the physics of the Big Bang? Why do we see stars and galaxies out there? You know, why do they clump together? Um, and the amazing thing that we find in physics is that the Big Bang, so the physics on the largest possible scale in the cosmos, is actually driven by the physics at the tiniest possible scale, uh, subatomic physics, um, because right very early on in the Big Bang, the universe was microscopic in size, and the physics that was going on there was the same physics that we see now in the subatomic realm. So uh, you know, the, the smallest scale and the biggest scales in the universe are, are very closely tied together. But there's a lot of questions out there, so don't get the impression that you, know, uh, you guys will have nothing to discover if you go off into physics. Uh, uh, there's lots of questions we'd like to know, like uh, what is mass? Why do we have it? Why are there three dimensions of space? Why is there one dimension of time? Uh, and so on, right? There's, there's tons and tons of very simple questions that we have no clue how to answer. So if I was going to put the course in a picture, this would be it. So this is a picture I took a few years ago uh, out at CERN when we were building uh, uh, one of the underground uh, uh, detectors there. So this is a small component. I mean, it's big, I realize. But it's a small component of the Atlas detector underground. It's one of the little end caps that measures muons. Uh, but it's about 270 tons. Uh, in fact, it was one of the bigger sub-detector components because they had to dismantle part of the building to, to fit it in. Um, but the reason this is the course in the picture is because you know, you've got a guy here that's trying to turn it round to fit it down a hole. So you've got a, a particle physics detector here. You've got elastic bands obeying Hooke's law. You've got a pulley. You've got a lever turning the pulley. And then you've got air cushions back here to uh, uh, reduce the friction uh, so that it is actually possible uh, uh, to turn it. So what this tells us is that you, know, you can't run in and jump straight into sort of solving the Dirac equation and doing all the fun particle physics without first having a basic understanding of Newtonian mechanics. And that is what we're going to be covering uh, uh, in this course. So all of this sort of uh, complex mechanical system here that's just simply used to turn uh, a detector. This is the, uh, most of the physics that we're going to be doing here. But then we'll get a little bit onto uh, special relativity. And I'll be throwing in examples of particle physics uh, throughout the course. OK, so measurements. So this is what underlies all of physics. Um, and we have two uh, um, equally important parts of every measurement. A measurement has a magnitude, and it has a unit. And if you leave out the units, you are leaving out part of the, uh, uh, you know, an important part of the answer. Right? If you want to think about it in everyday terms, if you go to an employer uh, and you sign up and they say, you know, how much are you going to pay me per hour? Uh, and they say, oh, I'll pay you 50. You know, and then it comes to payday and they give you 50 cents. Uh, you aren't going to be particularly happy. Right? So it is important to specify units. Right? Don't take them for granted. Um, you know, you've got to have the units specified in, in physics. So the units we use uh, are called the SI units. So this is the System International d'Unit. Uh, unité um, in French because it's a diplomatic agreement, so it's all in French, um, and it was actually invented by the French. So the Bishop of Lyon um, in 1600s, I think, was the uh, person who came up with this. 
So this is the system that's used by science uh, everywhere. Even in our neighbors to the south, uh, they use this in science most of the time, um, although they have tendencies. Um, but, but they use this most of the time. So we use length is the meter. Mass is the kilogram. This is unusual because it's the only SI unit that's not the base unit. Here we have kilogram, right, not gram. Right? So that's the SI unit of mass is the kilogram. Time, we have the second. Temperature, we have the Kelvin, um, where one Kelvin is the average temperature in Edmonton in winter, uh, or about minus 200 and uh, uh, zero Kelvin, sorry, two, minus 273 degrees centigrade. So please, no medieval British units, right? I grew up in Britain in the 70s, and even by that time, we had abolished using them. Uh, so it was very amusing when I first went to the US and they kept calling them English units. Um, it was even more amusing when I found out that they didn't even match the units that we used to use in England, um, because an imperial pint that's the same as you get here in Canada is 20 fluid ounces, whereas one pint in the US is 16 fluid ounces, um, which is uh, always a disappointment when you order a pint of beer south of the border. Um, or at least it was the first time I ordered a pint. Um, and even then, the definition of fluid ounce is different between Canada and the US, right? So, you know, there are multiple standards. They use crazy number scales. Um, we do not use these in, in, in for anything in science. So, unfortunately, the book is, uh, is a U.S. book, and so some of the questions use ounces and cubic fathoms or whatever it is. Um, um, so, please don't use those. We're just going to stick to the uh, uh, SI units. So, the SI units, they have a series of prefaces that we use to scale the units up and down. Uh, so, uh, common ones... Uh, are things like, you know, milli, as in millimeter, it's a thousandth of a meter, centimeter is a hundredth of a meter, um, and so on. And, you know, if you, if you get down to the you know, nanoscale nano physics, we've got the nano center here on, on campus, that's uh, 10 to the minus 9 meters. That's about the size of a single atom. Um, scaling upwards, uh, these are what you, a kilogram is a thousand grams, and then these are typically what you see for, in, in computers, you know, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, uh, uh, petabytes, uh, and even exabytes, although the, there is an exabyte tape that they used to have in the 1980s, and I was very disappointed uh, when, I was, uh, when I was using these to find out that the exabyte tape, rather than store 10 to the, 90, 10 to the 18 uh, bytes, actually stores uh, 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 10, to the, uh, uh, 10 to the 12. So it's a uh, six order of magnitude reduction in, uh, in scale. So, uh, um, and the highest one here is, is Yotta, 10 to the 24, which uh, astronomers could presumably use for some of the stuff they do. Um, now, the thing you have to be a little bit careful with, though, is things like terabytes. Uh, often, um, if you're a hard disk manufacturer, you use this definition because it makes your disk sound bigger. Um, usually, though, it's typically used uh, not as 1,000, but as 1,024, because that's 2 to the power 10, uh, and computers like uh, to do things in binary. So um, terabyte is not always uh, uh, 10 to the 15. It's, it's, it's sometimes 10 to the 1,024 to the power uh, uh, 5. So the base units, so the, our entire unit system is derived from base units, and these used to be derived from objects. So we had a platinum iridium bar that defined the meter. There were two scratches on it. Uh, a platinum iridium cylinder defined the kilogram. And the second was defined in terms of the Earth's rotation. Um, well, the problem is, is that the Earth is actually slowing down. A day, if you go talk to geologists, they'll tell you that, you know, billions of years ago, the uh, rotational period of the Earth was about 22 hours because the tides uh, uh, from the moon generate a friction and are slowly uh, slowing us down. So every day is really getting longer, uh, but only by a tiny, tiny amount. But if you're doing very, very accurate measurements, this is not a good way to define a, 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 basic for, a basis for units. So this was switched to so many oscillations of an electromagnetic wave uh, emitted from a cesium-133 atom, which was a very, very precise uh, uh, frequency. And one meter was defined in terms of that was the distance traveled by light in this many seconds. And that's because the speed of light is actually, as we'll see when we do relativity, a 
fixed universal constant uh, and, and, and does not change. And then on my last slide, mass, though, is still defined by a lump of platinum iridium sitting in Paris with about 80 national standards that are compared to it. Um, this actually has a, the, the reason we, is we don't have a good fundamental understanding of mass, so it's difficult to relate it to any other easily measurable quantity like we did for time um, and, and distance. Um, the other problem is, is that we don't have any way to scale a mass up a fundamental thing like the mass of an electron, we can't easily scale it up. There are some efforts going on in that with things like uh, uh, silicon spheres that are extremely pure and you can measure very, very accurately. Um, and they're trying to use that to define, uh, the ma uh, to define a, a kilogram by literally counting the atoms in a, in a uh, sphere of uh, uh, silicon. Um, so we, we may... We may be able to get that either from these silicon things or from developing a better understanding, but at the moment we still just use a lump of metal in Paris as our standard for mass. Okay, so I'll stop there and I'll see you guys all on Monday.